what I am concerned with, and, and I think you represent uh, in, in your last uh, intervention, a, a real um, trend in the Israeli society. Basically, what you said is that we should give up on peace. Now, I, 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 I cannot give up on peace, first of all. First of all, I, you know, I, I'm an Israeli, and I, I'm an Israeli father, and I'm not willing to give up on peace. This should be a goal, yes. And if it's hard or harder, then we should fight harder to, to do that. But to, to create the self-fulfilling prophecy that there's no chance for peace, and therefore we shouldn't take the necessary steps in order to achieve it, I think it's, it's a disaster for ourselves, for our country, and for our next generation. In order to set a tone for tonight's discussion, let me offer the following two quotes. The first is from the 13th century Persian Muslim poet Jaladin Rumi, who said, Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. The second quote comes from the well-known Israeli Jewish poet Yehuda Amichai, a poem called The Place Where We Are Right. From the place where we are right, flowers will never grow in the spring. The place where we are right is hard and trampled like a yard. But doubts and loves dig up the world like a mole, a plow, and a whisper will be heard in the place where the ruined house once stood. We live in challenging times. And in challenging times, there seems to be a basic human instinct to retreat into our own bubbles, to find security among the people who think like us and sound like us. In doing so, we create an echo chamber that reinforces our own views of the world. Now, when we stop to think about it, we know that this is false comfort, that drawing lines between us and them only deepens the divides that we wish to ignore. All of us are concerned by the rhetoric and cynicism that has taken hold of the political discourse. But as I have said before, we cannot speak about the divides out there and ignore the divides in here. Good evening. Uh, we are going to cram about four years worth of discussion into the next hour and a quarter. Uh, and we have a very distinguished panel with very diverse backgrounds that will look at the challenges uh, that lie ahead by looking back at the past 50 years. For those who think this is only a study in history or in futurology, we were talking at dinner about uh, what's happened just this week, and it's only Wednesday. Uh, Israel commemorated its Memorial Day, Yom HaZikaron, celebrated its Independence Day, Yom HaTzma'ut, watched as UNESCO voted to divorce Jerusalem from the Jewish people, uh, watched as the president of the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, uh, is visiting uh, Washington, and saw a modification in the charter of Hamas uh, which is, needs to be studied, whether it means something or not. And so you see that even though this is something of a historical analysis that we'll do tonight, uh, it changes every day, and the dynamics change. And so we're going to look at this both through the prism of history, but also what we can learn from that history as we deal with the issues of the day and, and look ahead. What I want to do in uh, launching the conversation is ask each of the panelists not to provide an opening statement so much, but to pick out one or two of the major transformations that he or she believes uh, are with us from the war in 1967. And then we'll look at the implications of what the panelists say as we move forward. Danny, maybe you can start with you. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Uh, obviously, the most important transformation was already mentioned by Gil, and that's the beginning of the occupation, which is an issue that, as Gil said before, is a huge issue in Israel, and we'll come back to it. But I'll mention two others that I think we think about much less. Uh, one of them may seem trivial, but I don't think it is, and it is that since 1967, Israel actually has holy places, which it did not for the first 19 years of its existence. And actually, Yom HaZikaron, I was listening to the radio, and a woman whose brother was killed in the battle for the Kotel was speaking, and she said that she went to the Kotel right after the war, knowing, of course, that her brother had been killed, and she saw these stones, and she said, for this, he died. This was just not worth it. And now, 50 years later, she says, obviously, 
the tragedy has never been entirely healed, but she understands with a perspective that Israel having places that have been holy to it, to the Jewish people for thousands of years, and she's a secular woman, has a kind of an impact on the way the homeness of Israel feels, and I think we sometimes take that very much for granted. The other thing that I think is just important to point out is that 67 is really the first time in several thousand years that the Jewish people takes a deep breath and doesn't feel assailed, doesn't feel nervous. That is going to get fractured a little bit in October 1973. Some would say permanently to some degree. Some would say not. Uh, but there was a period of six years between 67 and 73, at least when for the first time Israelis don't feel under threat. 49 was an armistice at best. It was a, a war that kind of groaned to a halt. Uh, 56 was not about anything having to do with the, the borders of Israel, really. Uh, 67 is the first time that the country actually isn't so small and isn't threatened. And just very quickly, anecdotally, um, my son-in-law, who actually happens to be in the audience tonight, uh, was with us, has been part of the family for a very long time, said to us once at a Shabbos meal when we were talking about the threats to Israel, he said, actually, I don't even know what you're talking about. I don't understand the angst. I don't understand the worry. Those of us that were born in Israel after 73 have never really had a moment in which we were worried about the existential survival of the Jewish state. Intifadas come and go. They're terrible. People on both sides suffer. But that the state was going to go down, never had a worry like that. He said, and this is a guy that was very significantly involved in the army for a very long time. Uh, and I think that 67 is that transformation period. As worried as we get, uh, we're not worried about the demise of the state. So I think it's transformative in lots of ways, both positive and complicated. I'm going to want to come back to that because uh, we do still hear a lot from, for example, Prime Minister Netanyahu about the, not just the memories of the Holocaust, but the implications of the Holocaust on Israel's security, perhaps vis-a-vis -vis Iran's nuclear program. So it's really a question of whether or not that angst is still there. Is it being used for political purposes? We'll come back to that, though. Eve. Perhaps you can comment now. So a few weeks ago, I was uh, on a speaking tour around the state, and I was waiting in Houston for a flight to Philadelphia. And the man next to me, big tattooed guy, starts talking to me. He asked where I was going. I said I was going to Philly. There was a scholar in residence with Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. I asked him where he was going. He said, well, I'm going to Bethlehem. I said, oh, that's really cool, because I, I live right near Bethlehem. And he said, really, where do you live? And I said, Ephrat. And he said, oh, I never heard of it. And I said, well, that's because I live near the real Bethlehem. You know, there's Shiloh, Kentucky, and Jericho, New York, and Bethel's everywhere, and Hebron's everywhere, and I live near the real Bethlehem. And that sense of not occupation, but liberation, is very much in the minds of, I think, many Israelis, was in 1967. Um, where I live, and we mentioned Memorial Day, which just happened a couple of days ago, um, I went to the cemetery in Kfar Etzion with one of my children, who's now a sergeant in the IDF. And the cemetery in Kfar Etzion is actually why there is Memorial Day in Israel the day before Yom Atzimut. The day before Ben-Gurion declares a state on May 14th, well, on May 13th, 1948, is when Kfar Etzion falls. There were Jews living in that area. And after they surrendered to the Jordanians, they were massacred. 240 Jews were killed there. And that became so important in the Israeli mind that that actually is the day that is Memorial Day for the entire country, is the day that Gush Etzion fell in 1948. So far from it being just like coming into land and the holy places, there are people in Israel in 1967 whose fathers had been killed, who had been raised in these areas, and, and this is a terrible term, but unfortunately it holds, ethnically cleansed from these areas. So while Arabs are left in Israel after the war and get Israeli citizenship, all Jews are thrown out of Judea and Samaria. And for 19 years, the, the place is Judenrein. And so the Jews, there are many Jews, myself included, who feel that we have come home. When I go to Italy and I stand under the Arch of Titus and you see the, you know, what was taken out from the temple and the tour guide there says to me, so where do you live? And I say, well, I live in Judea. And, and I cry because against all odds, we have come home. Um, we're the indigenous population. That's where Jew comes from. So I, it, it, and in 1967, many, many Israelis felt like that. There was a sense of awe. There was a sense of the miracle. In West Point at Military Academy, they do not study the Six-Day War because nobody can make heads or tails of it on a military sense. So there was that feeling which has faded over the last 50 years of being part of, you want to call it a miracle, you want to call it something greater than we were. And of course, being saved from annihilation at the time didn't hurt either. So as you've heard in the introductions, uh, 
this is a panel um, of Israelis, other than I, uh, but of very diverse backgrounds. Uh, you've heard some American accents. Let's hear from uh, Sana, uh, your views. Hello. So you've mentioned the Memorial Day and the Independence Day, but... Um, we'll I'll turn up the mics, probably. Yeah. <laughs> So as, as uh, was mentioned, uh, the Memorial Day and the Independence Day, but there's another day that we Palestinians also, uh, um, how to say, mark every year, which is the Nakba Day. Uh, that, that is the national catastrophe uh, of 48. Um, that's just as a remark. And uh, going up to the question, so I think that the two main things or um, processes that I see uh, that happened within the Palestinian society was one, the formation of Palestinian identity. Um, in, in the first years of, uh, of, of the Israeli state, so there was a sense of survival and most of us Arabs, we identify ourselves as Arab Israelis. Uh, rather than Arab Palestinians. And since 67, I think that um, there was a more, um, a stronger sense of identity. And uh, um, we relate much more to, to our families in the West Bank and the, in the Gaza Strip. And um, so that, that is one process, main process that uh, has happened. And I think that the second, with the annexation of Jerusalem and occupying the territories and the Golan Heights, so there was like several, um, several um, statuses of citizenship. Um, while in the West Bank, you can see that there is an occupation in Jerusalem there is, um, there is, you can have an identity, a blue identity, a citizenship, but you can, you don't have the full rights of a citizen. And of course, uh, in Golan Heights, where uh, residents choose whether to uh, have their citizenship as an Israeli citizen. Um, so that is for me the main It's interesting, thing. the issue you raise. I recall in uh, the year 2000, I was still serving in Egypt, uh, met with an Israeli negotiator who had just come from Camp David, which had not succeeded. And he said that he had been shocked when he was traveling around the country after Camp David to talk to one of the mayors of one of the Arab towns in Israel who said that it was imperative for his community, the Arab community, that there be peace so that the next generation of Arab children see themselves as citizens of the state of Israel mm -hmm. and not part of the larger Palestinian national movement mm -hmm. which would cross over or erase the border. So it's an interesting subject we'll come back to. Mm -hmm. Gadi. Shalom. Um, I just would like first to, to thank the organizers and, and the hosts not only for having me but for having this conversation. I think it's very important that Israelis and Americans will have this conversation and, and I, I really want to thank you all for, for the fact that you care, otherwise you wouldn't be, be here today. So thank you for that. Regarding maybe one thought about something that changed um, in 67, the first thing that came to my mind was that until 67, we as a country, we knew what we wanted. We wanted to, to make sure that we are not tempor a temporary phenomenon, that, that we don't have existential threats, that we are there to stay, and we want peace with our neighbors, which is the best way to ensure our existence. Since 67, all of us as individuals, we know exactly what we want, of course, but as a country, we, we never decided what we want. The government, different governments, never decided what they want to do with the territories with our borders, to annex them, to withdraw from them. Uh, we, we don't talk as Israelis uh, so much about peace. We, we don't know what we want. And, and I think that the 67 war was really maybe the most crucial moment in Israel's history. It was a huge victory, no doubt about it. But it had many consequences as well, um, in the words of 
by Charles Dickens, it was the best of times, the worst of times. Um, the age of wisdom and the age of fullness, the spring of hope and the winter of despair. I know I'm not at the despair stage, I, I'm, not, I'm not there, but, but I think we, we, we had so many achievements and we didn't know what to do with them. We, we multiplied the, the size of the, of the country by three times, and yet we don't know what to do with it. Uh, because we also got millions of, of people that lived in those uh, uh, territories. Yes, we, we came back to the Kotel, uh, uh, to the holy places for us, but we are next to Jerusalem, 28 Palestinian villages, and now Kfar Akeb and, and Kalandia refugee camp are part of this united Jerusalem. We never thought that this is the Jerusalem that we were praying uh, for. Yes, it gave us a great econo economic boost to Israel, the 67 war after years of recession. And, and suddenly you know, we had all this land and oil in Sinai and, and the cheap labor and, and new projects. But then we became kind of slaves of the occupation of, of this land and we're investing billions and billions in areas that we don't know if we want them or not. So, uh, in, so the, the, the fact is for me that yes, we won the Six Days War, no doubt about it, but we still yet to win uh, in the seventh day as well. So let me take the panel from Charles Dickens to Lewis Carroll. Uh, <laughs> paraphrasing Carol, who said, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. Uh, the question is, where, where is Israel going? Uh, both in terms of analysis, but also in terms of uh, your preference. Uh, we heard a very strong view from Eve about coming home to those territories. I think others on the panel might uh, feel differently. Where, where is the the goal here, what is the goal? What's the, the objective that the state should be striving for? Well, I think it's not only that we sometimes disagree between ourselves. I think at least in some of our cases, we're actually internally divided as well. In other words, when Eve talks about liberation, I actually resonate to that. In other words, I think that it's, and you didn't even point out that at Kfar it's not only that the village was taken in May 13th, but that everybody surrendered and was then massacred. I said that. Right, I, I, shit, I missed it. But, I mean, I think that you know, when you talk about liberation, I think that most of us resonate to that. And when you talk about the fact, the irony is, of course, that we're all on the wrong side, right? Biblical history unfolded in the West Bank, Judea, and Samaria, and the Philistines are kind of where the Jews are. So we right. should all say, okay, on the count of three, everybody switch, which is not really going to happen. But there's a lot, I mean, we can all internally, I think, we, we feel very conflicted about a lot of things. And I think that your question about the Lewis Carroll question is also that. Where do we want to go? Where are we going? Uh, just to kind of put it out there, in an ideal world, in a world in which you can wave a magic wand and everybody does what you think. This old notion of the two-state solution uh, is the one that I still think bodes best for the future of Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. It means giving up parts of our ancestral homeland, there's no question, parts of the ancestral homeland that Eve speaks about so powerfully that we did feel a sense of liberation and coming home to, no question. Having said that, uh, just to make sure that nothing get you know nobody can go home tonight and say nothing controversial got said. Um, I don't think that's going to be a problem. Get your, you know, ticket of admissions worth. I think that that's dead. I don't think it's going to happen. I think it's too late. Uh, and uh, we obviously don't all agree about that here. But uh, I say with tremendous sadness that it's very hard for me to imagine that we're going to have some sort of signing on the White House lawn with the Marine Band and the Palestinians and the Israelis and an American president in the middle shaking hands with everybody. I think, I think that's, that, that train has left the station. And I think, therefore, that what Israelis have to ask themselves, exactly what Gadi is saying, is if I'm right, that that's actually not possible anymore, for a whole array of reasons on both sides. Then the question is, how do we create a life in which we are not sitting on the heads of as many people as we're sitting on, and in which we're not feeling threatened the way that we feel threatened? I think that part of the problem is, and I think that Michal Goodman points this out very nicely in his brand new book called uh, Malkod uh, Shishim Besheva, Catch 67, mm -hmm. he says something very important, that the Israelis feel threatened and the Palestinians feel humiliated. And that's actually very true. We actually do feel threatened in large measure because we are threatened. I mean, we definitely are, and they also feel humiliated because they are humiliated. And I think the question 
for both sides is if the horse is out of the barn and we can't now get a two-state solution because of a whole array of issues we can come back to, what are the ways in which Israel can get out of the lives of most of those Palestinians and let them have something as close to autonomy as is possible, run their own lives, create their own society, fashion their own educational system, while we make sure that we actually have a certain amount of security apparatus along the Jordan River, et cetera, et cetera, to take care of ourselves. Uh, and to what extent are the Palestinians willing to move things forward by saying, if we insist on statehood or nothing, we're going to be right where we are forever. But if we're willing to inch forward and we're going to make certain accommodations as well, then maybe both sides, even without the grand signing ceremony, can make lives better for the other side and live life better themselves. Okay, can, can I'm I asking the questions. Comment? Okay, you, you asked two questions. Just give me the headline. What is it called? Is it Israel with a Palestinian minority with full rights? Or Israel with a Palestinian minority without full rights? Just the headline, and then we'll, we'll get into the substance later. No, it's called, um, it's called the Palestinian Authority. So long term, yeah. it's called the Palestinian yeah, Authority, but Israel has air rights and Israel has a has a military presence along the Jordan River, and um, to whatever extent they cooperate, their level of autonomy, which I would like to be 100% one day, but I don't think it's going to happen so fast. Mm -hmm. But the, the less we have to do with supervising their lives and coloring their lives, okay. the better. Got it. Just first of all, just a comment uh, for you in one of the meetings of negotiators on both sides. We, we try al always to, to tell them, to educate them about our ties to the land, that we are not there by coincidence as they present their, their case. So in one of the conversations, actually one of them said, you know, if you care so much about Hebron and Nablus and Bethlehem, take it. We care about Jaffa and Majdal, which is today Ashkelon and Ashdod and Ramle and Akko. So we'll switch. It was the real official proposal by a Palestinian negotiator. And what year? Uh, 15 years ago. We rejected it, don't worry. But, uh, <laughs> but this, it, it was... Now, now, but what I am concerned with, and, and I think you represent uh, in, in your last uh, intervention, a, a real um, trend in the Israeli society. Basically what you said is that we should give up on peace. Now, I, 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 I cannot give up on peace, first of all. First of all, I, you know, I'm an Israeli, and I'm an Israeli father, and I'm not willing to give up on peace. This should be a goal, yes. And if it's hard or harder, then we should fight harder to, to do that. But to, to create the self-fulfilling prophecy that there's no chance for peace, and therefore we shouldn't take the necessary steps in order to achieve it, I think it's, it's a disaster for ourselves, for our country, and for our next generation. Now, just a quick response to the question, what do we want beyond peace, which should be a goal in my view. Um, the State of Israel was created as, as, the, as a Zionist project. Zionism, for me, is, is, the, is, the, if, is it, to create a situation where the Jewish people will have a key to one place on earth. So we can open the door or close the door if a Jew from Boston or from uh, uh, Ukraine or Argentina wants to come, we, he, he can come and become a citizen. If we are going to lose the key because we become a minority in our own country, or if we become a, a non-democratic country which eventually either because of international circumstances or, or because the Palestinians will not agree to, to be second degree citizens and they will take over and we will be part of an Arab country, we will lose the key. And that will be the end of the Zionist project. So the goal is to maintain the key in our hands in a democratic and Jewish state. If. So I agree with what Gadi said. I think we absolutely have to constantly be searching for peace. And that's why I'm against a two-state solution. Because a two-state solution is not only a recipe for peace, it's a recipe for war. Abbas is now in the 12th year of a four-year term. When we, when we speak about living in democracies, both in Israel and in America, our leaders represent us, for better or for worse, majority rules. That's not the case in the Palestinian Authority. When negotiators speak to the leaders of the Palestinian Authority, who have taken your money, by the way, the billions of dollars 
that good people around the world, the American government and the Europeans and the Japanese, and everybody has funneled into the Palestinian Authority over the years, has gone to line the pockets of the leaders of the Palestinian Authority and not into the little people. And therefore, if we establish a Palestinian state, not only will it be inimical to Israel, because it will be a tremendously long border with people who vow to destroy Israel. They talk about a phased solution, which is first getting Judea and Samaria and then getting the rest of Israel. The PLO was established in 1964, when Israel didn't have Judea and Samaria. So not only will it be dangerous to Israel and to potential people who want to come and live in Israel from Boston, but it will be a misery for the Arabs living there themselves. I coexist with Arabs. I shop at the Gush Etzion Junction, the famous Gush Etzion Junction that has known many stabbings and many problems over the last year and a half. I shop with them. I get my car fixed with them. Those of us living in Judea and Samaria are actually a sign of coexistence. When people would say to me, there's going to be a two-state solution and you have to leave, I ask, what about that sentence is coexistence and peace? Well, you can't stay. It'll be dangerous. One more time. So what about this two-state solution is coexistence and peace? I demand that there be peace, just like you do. And because of that, we cannot establish a Palestinian state. The Middle East is covered now with failed Arab states, all right, everywhere. We need to establish another one when we see already in the last few years that they have done nothing for their own people. So for the exact reasons that my panelists here and I desperately want peace, Everyone, we all have skin in the game here. We all live here. Our children get on the buses. Our children go to coffee shops. If there isn't peace, those of us here on the stage are the ones to suffer. And the differences between us, I think, are how to get that. And I think that that's a very important point to make. There isn't one person up here who doesn't so the want same, peace. The same question I posed to Danny, though. OK, we now know what you don't want. OK. Give me the headline of what, what, it, what it will be if you had your way. You're now prime minister. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> All right, so Just first of all, I will agree with you again, is that we have a very confused series of governments who didn't take decisions. Okay, like I don't live in a state right now. All right, we serve in the army and we pay our taxes, but I technically don't live in a state. And that means that if the village across the street from me wants to burn their garbage or put sewage in the, in the ground, they can. So I think we should start off with applying Israeli law in what's called Area C, the areas where all the Jewish communities are. And that not, would apply to the Palestinians no. as well? Uh, the ones right. living in Area C, there's about 80,000. It's not a demographic problem. And believe me, we've talked to them. They, they can't wait to be a part of so Israel. So in Area C, you would apply Israeli, Israeli law, law. Now, for everybody? For everybody. For the Israelis for, living For there everybody the living in Area C. Well, and that area means a. Israeli law, meaning that the laws of a Western country apply when it comes to the environment, when it comes to quarrying, when Israeli it comes to the Israeli law do apply to the Area C. No, it does not. I mean, yeah. Israeli yeah. Legal, yeah. Law legal law on Israelis. the land and everything. It also, incidentally, would mean getting the army out of that area. You don't have the army in Tel Aviv. A place that's a civilian area doesn't need the army. I think it's terrible for our soldiers to be in this area. And the, it weakens them for what they really need to do, which is fight the borders or Iran or the enemies okay, out one there. One sentence. What do you do so with that, the areas A and B? For so just, I would agree one, with one, one word yeah. of background under Oslo, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Under yeah. Oslo, the uh, territory was divided into three areas. Area A, uh, civil and security responsibility was handed over to the Palestinian Authority, and it included the eight major or seven major cities, but a relatively small amount of area. It was the cities themselves and a little bit of the surrounding area. Area C was reserved for Israel. That's where all the settlements are, uh, military bases. And Area B was a mixture. It was Palestinian civil control, Israeli security control. At the end of the day, Israel controls about 60% of the West Bank between areas B and C, just so we all on the same wavelength. Mm -hmm. So just to finish, I do not think that we should um, annex everything and offer citizenship to the Arabs living it, not just for demographic reasons, but um, Israel is a great country. And I think people who become citizens of Israel should deserve it. And America is the same right now. It's very hard to get American citizenship. And so I think that, and also for demographic re you know, for the demographic reasons, but I think we need to first apply Israeli law, complete Israeli law in Area C. And there are all kinds of ideas 
about what to do with, as you said, the, the main villages. Something like 93, 94% of the Arabs of Judea and Samaria live in either areas A or B. There's confederations with Jordan, giving them Jordanian citizenship. There's a plan of Moti Kedar, Bar Ilan University. I actually just interviewed him a few weeks ago, of making emirates, of having each city be run by the major families, by the tribes in those cities. And he says, like, the, U, the United Arab Emirates is the most stable right now Arab country in the Middle East, something of those, along those lines. But by not allowing the terrorists to control those cities, which is horrible for them and, of course, for us, and having Israel be in security control, it will, I think, and, and there's a lot of proof for that, leave a lot of room for growth and development and trust on both sides. Once they know that Israel is taking care of everyone's security. Sorry, there was one, 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 one fact that you didn't mention in, in, in trying to having everybody on the same page. The area C that you were talking about, it's not one contiguous area that you can annex to Israel. It's hundreds of isolated places spread all around the West Bank, so you cannot actually bridge them without uh, going through area A and B where the no, Palestinians the are. Roads, there are the yeah, we can have roads. No, I don't there know, are space roads, roads now. You can go to any Jewish okay. community. Yeah, but the Palestinians cannot go from one place to another. All right, Sana, please. Okay, okay. So, <laughs> right, sit back. A yeah, a lot have uh, been said in here. And I just wanted to say, like, who knows what the solution? I mean, we're talking about one state solution, two state solution. Who knows what will happen? We're still in a very primary phase where we're still dealing with the occupation and we're still dealing with, hun with hundreds of settlements um, uh, that every day violates the, the, the human rights of the Palestinian citizens, not citizens, uh, sorry, in the occupied territories. Um, and you, you said that you feel threatened, that Israel feels threatened. Well, it cannot be an excuse to the violation of human rights. It cannot hold any longer. And the, the, the Zionistic project, the Zionist project, well, eventually it, it, it says to me, like a Palestinian woman in Israel, living in Israel, that you are not wanted here. I mean, you as a Jewish and every Jewish person in the world has a right of return to, to Israel almost, almost automatically. But for me, if I want to marry a Palestinian or if I want to marry an Arab citizen of a other country, I, 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 will, I will be refused. I will be refused because there is a law that says that I cannot marry an Arab person from an Arab state. So, so you can marry them, they just don't become citizens. You can right. marry anybody you want. Well, what does that mean? But that, that means that ha I have just like to... The law doesn't say I you can't have, marry that person. I have right. to pass on my citizenship. Okay, but the law just doesn't say that you can't marry that person. That is the result, the final result of the so, law. It's easier to divorce than to marry. <laughs> this case. In general. Can I ask yeah. <laughs> yeah. So now I want you to, if you could relate to something that Eve said, and I'll, I'll, I'll start it off with a, a story. Uh, right after the Oslo Accords were signed, I met with a Palestinian, he was about 35 years old at the time, who had spent about 15 years in Israeli jail for killing an Israeli during the previous period. He had been released, and in a meeting, I said to him, are you ready now to live in peace and so forth? He said, look, he said, I have two answers for you. He said, if Yasser Arafat, who is about to come back to the territories, thinks that he can come here and impose a traditional Arab autocratic regime, I will fight against Yasser Arafat. If Israel thinks that it can maintain an occupation, I will fight again against Israel. So the question is, are the Palestinians, in your view, in the West Bank and ultimately in Gaza, ready for the kind of democracy that Eve suggested wouldn't happen if there were a Palestinian state? Well, I don't think that, that we can, like Israel can decide whether they are ready for a democracy or not. That is not a question that Israel has to answer. Uh, uh, our, Israel cannot give rights or prohi prohibit rights from, uh, from people. It cannot control the lives of millions of people uh, that are put under a military rule and say that they are not ready for democracy. It's not Israel's decision. No, but that's not the question. That wasn't the question, question is, do you think, forgetting right. what Israel thinks, do you think the population there is ready to have a democracy? I think that after 
so many years of suffering and occupation that, of course, Palestinians are ready for democracy. Like in Gaza? But, but let me when, there, when there's no Jews left there anymore? But let me ask you, when, let me ask you a question in this context. Since you, can all, you all can see that I'm old enough, I, 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 I remember the days where we signed peace with Egypt. I remember the Israelis who said, how can you make peace with the regime, you know, a one bullet regime, a non-democratic regime in Egypt? And they oppose it exactly for the same reasons that you oppose the establishment of a Palestinian state. Now today we know that those who oppose peace with Egypt were wrong. And still, Egypt is not a Jeffersonian democracy, I think, till this very day. <laughs> and yet, we better have peace with Egypt than not having peace with Egypt. Uh, I, uh, I shared with the uh, panel uh, a couple of weeks ago a quote with which they're very familiar. Uh, you know, we often turn to our founding fathers when we're looking for guidance. And I shared a quote from one of Israel's founding fathers, David Ben-Gurion, which let me read it quickly and, and get some reactions, because it's very germane to this discussion. Ben-Gurion basically was asked by the military back in 1949 uh, whether or not uh, Israel should take over the West Bank. And it was a period in the fighting when Israel could have taken over the West Bank and had control over all of the land uh, west of the Jordan River. Ben-Gurion's response was uh, basically the following. Although he said this in the Knesset, it was the, the same thought. He said, assuming that militarily we could conquer all of Western Israel, and I am sure of this, then what would happen? We would make one country, except that that country would want to be democratic. There would be general elections, and we would be in the minority. Hence, when faced with the question of the wholeness of the land without a Jewish state, we chose a Jewish state without the wholeness of the land. Now, demographers today argue over how many people live between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean. 10, 11 million, maybe 52, 48, 51, 49. But the reality is that a, a single territorial unit would call into question a Jewish majority unless there was, in fact, a border between it. How does contemporary Israel relate to what the Founding Fathers said, which is you may have to make a choice between a state in which there's a Jewish majority and a democratic state, but it doesn't hold all of the land of Israel. So, oh, okay. it's, uh, it's, there's always a temptation to take somebody like Ben-Gurion, who I think was an extraordinary, I mean, Yitzhak Navon called him the greatest Jew who lives since King David. And I think there's actually some good evidence to say that he was one of the great Jews of all time, there's no question. However, having said that, is there's a great temptation, you know, decades after his life, to kind of turn Ben Gurion into a, uh, you know, a Jeffersonian type. Well, you have to remember that Ben Gurion, while first of all he did not want to capture the West Bank, that's true. Part of the reason for that is the country was just exhausted. One percent of the Jewish population of the country had been killed. One percent of the citizens, in other words, take the United States, that'd be what 3.6 million people. And it was, it's a huge loss in the war. The country was exhausted. Almost every able-bodied man was 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 in the army. The country couldn't go on anymore. He understood that at a certain point, you just got to say enough and we're going to move on. Uh, so some of it was this very poetic notion of the wholeness of the land, et cetera, et cetera. Part of it, the country was out of gas and needed to put men to work and not at war. You also have to remember that Ben-Gurion uh, was, if Sana mentioned before, the Nakba, which is the term that Palestinians use for everything that happened to Palestinian society in 47, 48, and 49. Um, Ben-Gurion's the architect of that in large measure. In other words, part of, part of what Ben-Gurion did was make a conscious decision that for democratic, demographic purposes, significant number of particularly Galilee, but others as well, Palestinians would have to be moved out. So I don't want to, I don't want to like, you know, do a, a cleansing of Ben Gurion. He's a very complicated guy, and he didn't have any easy solutions to complex problems, to complex problems either. But I think that that's, I think the point that you make, and look, by the way, Ben Gurion in 67, he's no longer prime minister, Eshkol's prime minister, but he's very much with it. Um, he dies in December 73. But in 67, he's completely got his marbles, and as soon as the war is over, he says, keep Jerusalem, because it's sacred to the Jewish people, keep the Golan Heights, because you do not give that back to Syria, and get rid of everything else. So he was consistent from what you're quoting him as saying in 49, and what he said in the middle of 67. The problem is, we don't get to have, this is not Mr. Potato Head, that we get to put on the pieces that we want to make it fit exactly that, like we want. I think actually this, you know, everybody here is representing a kind of a truth to their own view, their own worldview that we can all understand. I mean, I don't think none of us are looking at each other and saying that makes no sense. 
given the fact that um, the, the Palestinian, I do think that the Palestinian is much more of a threat, obviously, than Sana does. I think there is a serious issue of ongoing hostility. Uh, I think that what Ben Gurion was smart about was that the wholeness of the land can never be an ideological absolute. Neither at the same time was he afraid of manipulating demography when he needed to. So I actually went recently to a very interesting lecture about Ben-Gurion as, uh, as compared to Menachem Begin, and Danny may know this because he wrote an excellent book, incidentally, about Menachem Begin, is that um, Ben-Gurion intentionally did not want the holy places because the country that he wanted to build now was the new Jew, was not necessarily the Jew tied to the Bible and to the old, but a new kind of Jew. And proof for that comes that after the riots in 1929, the pogroms in 1929, where the Jews in Hebron were killed, they get the main headlines, but Jews all over the country were killed, in Svadid, in Jerusalem, in different places. The places that he rehabilitates are the places in what becomes then what I'll call Little Israel, places like Cholda, etc. Uh, not Hebron, and even not Jerusalem to a great degree. So to ben there, was a, there was a lot more to Ben-Gurion than just like that demographic issue. But if I may, I have a question for Sana. Um, you represent, and your, your life's work is to make lives better in the Bedouin and the Negev. So my very simple question is, do you consider yourself a Palestinian or an Israeli Arab? Because the Negev is not part of Judea and Samaria. It is part of Israel since 1948. Where, how do you describe yourself? I do describe myself as a Palestinian, but I'm also a citizen of Israel. Mm -hmm. So that's so you feel like of tied feel. to whatever. Of course, point. I feel my family is there. Mm -hmm. My family is there. These are my people. So do, would you want to see the Negev as an Arab entity, like all of Israel, also? I mean, come on, don't I, I don't have like a dream of one uh, united uh, uh, country like you have. I I want a solution that it is uh, equal for both sides. I want a solution that will respect both people, uh, uh, Israelis and Palestinians. I want to see a reality that uh, uh, has uh, equality and has uh, uh, basic human rights for everybody. Which That's what are. I want. Which can, can, I, can I respond to your yeah, question? Yeah, comment, and then I want to switch gears before we get to the Q&A, so go okay. ahead. So just, just to your question, uh, I mean, I, I don't know if it's a wise thing to mention both names in one sentence, but I don't want to talk only about Ben-Gurion, but about another prime minister, Netanyahu. Netanyahu doesn't want to annex the West Bank. He doesn't want to withdraw from the West Bank because of his fears, national fears, political fears, personal fears, but he doesn't want to annex them. He, 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 he says that he doesn't want it because he, do, he doesn't want what he calls a binational state. Why? Exactly because of your point. In an ideal world, we would have a, a three-dimension fulfillment of a dream, a, a, a Jewish state, a democratic state on the entire land of Israel. I feel I have the same ties to the land of Israel like Eve has. We have the same history. I, I, I share the same, the same feelings, but I know that the land is not empty. And I know that I'm not willing to give up on the equality and on the human rights that Sana spoke here before. Yes, we may differ on the question who can enter the country, but once people are citizens of the country, they all have to enjoy the same identical e equal rights. Which they do. Uh, which, which they do. Okay. But, if, but not, between the, not between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean. But that's not, not what we're talking okay, about. Okay, no, about we're talking Israel. about the West Bank. So you have to choose two out of the three. You can have the entire land of Israel and be a Jewish state, but then you will not be a democracy. You can be a democracy and have the entire uh, land of Israel, but then you will not be a Jewish state. Or you can be a Jewish and democratic state, but then you have to give up part of the land. Now, my ideology is not about a two-state. My ideology is about my own state, about Zionism. But I understand that in order to have it the best way and the most moral way also, is to have the two-state solution, because I think the Palestinians deserve their own state. Now, it fits, that it fits our interest as well. So it's, it's the best practical solution. It's not part of my ideology. If the Palestinians decide to be part of Jordan or part of Guatemala, it's up to them. It, it's not up to me, but if they are part of my country, then it's against my ideology, because I'm losing either my, the Jewishness of the state or the democratic character of the state. And this, I'm not willing to give up. 
Okay, you've now had a, a peek into a discussion which happens every day in Israel, uh, around every around Shabbat table, around the clock. Uh, but we're having this discussion in Massachusetts. And so what I want to ask our panel of four Israeli citizens is about the future of uh, U.S.-Israeli relations at two levels. One is we have a Trump administration, and this is a state that by and large did not vote for Mr. Trump. Uh, I think that's well known. Um, so there's one level, which is the formal level, US-Israel governmental level. And the other is Israel and the American Jewish community, in which there have also been rather profound differences that have emerged, not just on the political questions of occupation, but also on questions of personal status. Who is a Jew and who really controls questions of divorce and conversion? And I, I want to stimulate a little bit of discussion of that, and then we'll get to uh, the Q&A where the audience will have a chance to focus in on what they want. Who wants to start? I'll start. Eve. Look, I think 1967 gave American Jewry a standing. All right, the United States, right before, the, in, right before Van Gorgon declared the state in 48, had actually rescinded their support for the state because the Jews were getting killed on the roads, and America did not want to back a losing horse. And for the first 19 years of Israel's existence, we were not in the American circle of influence. It's only after 1967 and after Israel is strong and seen as reliable and seen as a country that America can depend on for America's interest, be there oil or whatever it is in the Middle East, that America really becomes a big supporter of the United States. And that gives American Jews a standing that we didn't have before, that you didn't have before. All right, so we want to talk about 1967 and what it does for the relationship with America. I think it profoundly impacts the standing that American Jews then have. Uh, when it comes to certain issues in Israel, I, I personally, and again, this is to everything I'm saying here is my personal view, I think the chief rabbinate should have been, been, been dismantled in Israel a long time ago. In my mind, it's one of the worst things to happen to Judaism in a very long time. Okay? That I, normally gets the biggest round of applause, by the way. Maybe <laughs> not tonight. And I'm saying this as someone who tries to live a traditional lifestyle to keep Shabbat, etc., um, I think a lot of the things that the rabbinate does push pe pushes people away from Judaism. A lot of it has to do with power and money and, and access and jobs and all the things that politics brings out the worst in people. And I think it's high time that we really had a proper separation of, of church, church and state in Israel. And so, you know, in terms of that, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of issues there that definitely have to be dealt with when we can take a breath and deal with those too. Danny? Let's leave the, uh, the Trump administration out, because I think it's just literally like trying to guess the weather five weeks from now. But I think that um, the weather could be very good. Or but, tomorrow uh, morning. Right, exactly. Yeah. But let, I think that the issue, the relationship between American Jews and Israel is going to get more complicated and not less, it seems to me. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, one of them is, is that I think as much as the, the, the conversation that we're having here tonight, and by the way, the one thing that there was only one thing tonight that I think has been said that I really don't agree with, and that is that this is the conversation that's happening in Israel every day and met at our Shabbos tables. We never talk about this. We never, ever, 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 ever talk about this, except the one time that my son-in-law was over, because there's nothing to talk about. We're stuck. And there's no way to get it unstuck right now. We're talking about what movies we've read and what books we've seen, what, what movies we've right. seen, etc. What, what our kids are doing in university, what, you know, etc. So I'm guilty of transference because well, it's the conversation that we have. Well, that's exactly time. that's exactly my point. I think that the, the conflict, as much as it's an enormous, grinding, sad, painful reality for both sides, is actually not what Israel's about. Israel is not the conflict. And the American Jewish conversation about Israel is about the conflict. And I say to the people here today, tell me if I'm wrong in a minute when we open up the Q&A, but I'm willing to bet that out of the last 20 conversations that you had about Israel, they can be disguised as Obama was good or bad, or Trump is going to be good or bad, or the Iran, the Iran deal is going to hold, is not going to hold, you know, Hamas, the charter, whatever the case may be. But in some way, the conversation about Israel is always about Israel in light of the people who live around Israel. And it's never about what's happening to the Jewish soul inside Israel. What does a book like uh, Eshkol Nevo's Neuland say about the yearnings of modern Jews? What does it mean for somebody like David Grossman to write a book like To the End of the World or uh, something, I'm small, something like that? Um, what, what's going on in Israeli art? What's going on music. in Israeli music? What are Israelis dreaming about? 
That kind of stuff, which is totally accessible in English, by the way, is the stuff that by and large American Jews have chosen not to know about. So it's as if we want to talk about America and its greatness, and all we can say is 1776, 1812, Civil War, First World War, Second World War, <laughs> Vietnam, Korea, etc. That's not America. It's not American. Anybody that spoke about America that way is having a twisted conversation about America that leaves out Martin Luther King, that leaves out Thomas Jefferson, that leaves out yeah, all of the things that make this country great. And that's what the American Jewish conversation is doing to Israel. And that's part of the reason that the younger generation is just washing their hands of it and saying, who wants it? It's just bad news, when in fact it's actually a fascinating place. The other reasons that I think we don't have time to get into, but I think Israel's becoming a more overtly religious country. I don't mean that it's becoming more right-wing religiously. I just mean that the public square in America is meant to be somewhat religiously neutral. Uh, Israelis, especially Mizrahim, the, the, North, the, the Levant Jews, the North African, Yemenite, Iraq, Iran, they're more than half of Israel's Jews now. And that's, you know, people like you and me are a minority of America's Jews. All, all, all four of us, except for Sinai, is not Jewish. We're, we're a minority of, of Jews in Israel. We're not from that North African tradition, which is much more nationalist by instinct, much more conservative with a small c religiously by instinct, uh, much less theologically sort of looking for theological consistency in a European kind of a way, and much more by instinct. It's a kind of a Judaism with which American Jews, by virtue of being very European and Western, are, I think, increasingly uncomfortable. So for a lot of ways, reasons I, I personally think that if we want to fast forward 50 years, the relationship between American Jews and Israel is going to be much more attenuated. I think that there are going to be two major Jewish communities in the world. Each is going to have their major challenges. Each is going to have their major successes, God willing. Uh, but the sense of interaction and interplay that we take for granted now, I fear, and I say this tremendous sadness, uh, I think that the grandchildren of today's college kids are not going to feel that angst. Today's college kids are acting out mostly in terms of anger at Israel. The grandchildren of anger is just not caring one way. It's an interesting reminder. Gadi uh, wants to talk next, but I, I would just add, I, I mentioned uh, at dinner that when I was serving as ambassador and Israeli groups would uh, come to speak to me before they were visiting the United States, I always advise them to get out of New York and Washington, visit a Civil War battlefield, understand our history a little bit, go to a baseball game, where I have to tell you Gotti's son is tonight, where most of us would rather be, I think. Uh, but in other words, go beyond the, what, we, the, the, what, what you were saying, you know, the 1776 uh, syndrome. And I think it's a good reminder about what we have to do as Americans in trying to get into the Israeli soul mm -hmm. and culture as well. Gadi. Yeah, um, as much as I would like to, to agree with my colleagues here, I don't find it very easy. And, and right. I think, I'm trying, <laughs> really, believe For me, the I'm, sake trying, of peace, I'm trying. Try. Uh, but but uh, 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 Daniel here, I, I, know, I know we're supposed to do the opposite. Uh, uh, kind of uh, hot buttons and cool conversations, but I think Daniel here pressed a, a cool button that made me want a, a hot conversation, actually. <laughs> and, and so I'm sorry for that, but uh, because you said that uh, we in Israel, we don't have this conversation uh, because it, everything is stuck with the conflict. Now, people that I know, maybe the circles that I'm, you know, friends with, we, we are having this conversation all the time because we are stuck. This is exactly the reason. If we were stuck and things were moving in the right direction, then we can talk about music. But I cannot feel that I'm on the Titanic, and then now let's talk about music. <laughs> we, are, we have many icebergs out there, and we will talk about music. Now, the, 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 the state of Israel was, was established to, to, to ensure Jewish continuity, to make sure that the Jewish people will continue to exist. It's not that the Jewish people were created in order to make sure that Israel exists. So what happens in Israel, the future of the state, Jewish, non-Jewish, democratic, non-democratic, Israel, not Israel, it is exactly your business, the, the, those of you who are, who are Jews. And I think it's an issue that it, should, it, it is becoming maybe more and should become more of an issue for, for American Jews. I respect a lot the ideas about pluralism, and I understand the views, and I understand why it is important, and I think it is, but, but I don't think it's the only issue. And, and, and I'm concerned. 
maybe because I'm Jewish, I'm, I'm always concerned, but, but I'm concerned <laughs> the issue of, of the relationship between Israel and, and American Jews in, in, at, the, at the current uh, time. I'm afraid that if in American Jews you said that this state didn't vote overwhelmingly on, 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 for Trump, so I can imagine an American Jew who will, have, who will face a dilemma. If he's against the values that the Trump administration or Trump represents, on one hand, he's, he, he, he's in favor of Israel, he likes Israel, he loves Israel, but he or she, they see that Israel is affiliated with this Trump administration, with Trump's view, views, with the wall between the US and Mexico, Netanyahu tweeted the, about it that he supports the idea and, and, and so on. If an American Jew will be will confront this dilemma if he has to be against his own values or not, not anymore affiliated with Israel, I'm afraid that he will go for the second choice. And then we will lose many of you. And, and I think it's, it's a challenge. I, I'm concerned with the, with the US administration attitude towards Israel, not because Trump is more friend of the right or the left or whatever. I don't see the, 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 a, a president that is committed, that really cares. I want someone who cares about us, who cares about our future. Not, it's not a, a real estate deal. It's much more than that. And I'm afraid that we will become just another interest for the US administration without the special ties, the shared values that we once had at least. And, and we may lose on both fronts. On, on, on the U.S. administration, on the American Jewish community. So I think together, doesn't matter if we belong to the right or to the left, what we think exactly about the future of this settlement or another settlement, uh, we need to confront this challenge and to see how together we fight in order to make sure that Israel continues to exist as our home and as your home. If. Um. I think that the American administration and America in general needs to respect Israelis enough to let us decide on our future. We talk about democracy all the time. What that means is the citizens of that country get to decide the direction of the country. Now, I, I, see, I see what you're saying in terms of the country getting more religious, but I don't agree in the sense that I see certain people, I wouldn't say getting less religious, but there's an Israeliness being born. Uh, as a tour guide, I'm always at archaeological sites. And I never used to see the ultra-Orthodox there. Because what if you find something that contradicts the Bible, right? So they wouldn't come. And now more and more, you go, let's say, to the city of David in Jerusalem, which is an outstanding site, I see people with the hats and the black coats and everything. And I realize, A, that not only are we finding things that don't contradict the Bible, we're finding things that they're very comfortable with. Which is but why there's, they're there. Yeah, which is why they're there, which is fine. But there's an Israeli that's being born. So I'll agree with you that there is going to be a drift in, between America and Israel because there is a new kind of Jew in Israel. It, you want to call it nationalistic, you want to call it proud, not necessarily religious because there are a lot of Israelis. Most Israelis don't consider themselves religious. But Friday night, everybody gets together for family. Almost all of them will fast on Yom Kippur. And so what exactly does religious mean? I think we need to define that to some degree. But what I'm worried about in terms of America and the college students that we mentioned here, how many of the grandchildren of these college students now are going even to be Jewish? Natan Sharansky famously said, maybe who is a Jew shouldn't be whose grandparents were Jewish, but whose grandchildren will be Jewish. And that is an issue that we worry about very much less in Israel than you worry about here. So Israel needs America, but you also need Israel because I think that there's a great pride there in the things that we accomplish. And we do not, I don't get up in the morning every day and think about the conflict. Yes, I'm worried, especially because I wash dog tags. When you have a child in the army, you can't be very far from what's happening because it's in your face. It's not a pleasant experience. It's the ultimate in pride mixed with fear. But we can do this. We can take care of ourselves unless we do something really stupid and ignore what's going around us in the region and truncate ourselves to the point where we might be democratic, but we also might fight an existential war, where there's Iran, and there's all these people around us who get up in the morning and do tell their populace 
it's time to wipe out the Zionists. We bring people together. What can I tell you? They're all united. They're not united on anything else. They're united on that. We can't ignore that. We can't have that hubris, which is like what brought us the Yom Kippur War, the arrogance after 67, to say, we're just going to do what we want to do. We left Gaza. We pulled 10,000 Jews out of Gaza, destroyed 25 villages, and we got Hamas and a terror state. Okay, and yes, we have peace with Egypt, but I stand at the border in the Negev and I listen to the fighting of the Salafis who went now into the Sinai because it's a demilitarized zone. And Sinai is not a wonderful place. And El Sisi right now is keeping things together, but who knows what'll be tomorrow. And then you have jihadists and ISIS right next to the Negev. So we can't ignore the region. We can't be so full of ourselves that we don't see what's going on around us. And despite everybody not understanding why, in a poll that was recently taken, we're the 11th happiest country in the world. Nobody understands why. <laughs> what do you have to be happy about? But we are, right after like Scandinavia and Australia and countries where they don't worry about anything. We are happy. We're a family and faith-based society. Take faith any way you want it. And that's a strength that America used to have and doesn't have anymore. And that's incidentally why when Christians come to Israel, they see something that America used to have and lost. And, and, they, and they, they see that. They see us. We still are the light into the nations, in what, not because we're better than anybody else, but be, despite all the adversity and all the fact, and everybody coming after us for the last, who knows, thousands of years, not only are we existing, we're thriving. But we have to be very, very careful because we still live in a very dangerous neighborhood and in a very dangerous world. And it's not just about us. I think many of you. I don't know how many people I would speak for, but I, I would certainly take issue with one of your last comments. I think the American Jewish community is a very happy and prosperous and successful oh. community. I didn't uh, say it wasn't. It's nervous marvelous. about, particularly nervous now, about the impact that this administration may have on our civil rights. Nervous about the direction that some of the policies of the administration are going. Nervous about what could be a distinction that the administration is drawing between being pro-Israel but allowing anti-Semitism to creep into its policies. So that's a, it's a far different way of framing the issue than a dynamic Israeli society and a uh, maybe a coward American Jewish society. It's not oh, quite that coward. simplistic, and it certainly would be uh, an interesting conversation in and of itself. For so the not, next session. Anything, for the next session, anything yeah, you want to well, add? Obviously, I'm here because I think that there is a great importance in talking to the um, Jewish American audience and one of the basic reasons why I think so is that Americans have a deeper sense of what is a proper democracy. When I, talk, when I talk about occupation, people can relate to that, that there is a violation of human rights. When I talk about segregation, people can relate to that. When I talk about discrimination, people can understand that. And that's why I think that the intervention or, or your contribution to, to the debate in Israel is very important. And um, I will... Okay. I think we'll probably now turn to uh, Q&A. Uh, could the panel comment on the question oh. of the United States moving the embassy to Jerusalem? <laughs> Should they do it and what will happen and do the Israelis want it, not want it, and how will the region react? Well, Israelis are like Americans. They don't all agree about the same thing. Uh, so some Israelis couldn't care less, some Israelis want it very much, and some Israelis think it would be foolish because it would ignite, the, it would just be a cause of ignition uh, that we don't need. Uh, my own guess is that it's going to be used as some sort of a bargaining chip, that unless you do X, I'll move the embassy, or if you do Y, I'll move the embassy. But I think it's actually, my own sense, may tell me if you guys disagree, but my own sense is that it's become much more of a hot potato in the United States than it is in Israel. Israelis mm -hmm. are just, you know, they want to know what's it going to do to land prices, basically. <laughs> right. uh, and, and, to, and, the, and if people from Tel Aviv will have to drive to Jerusalem in order to get their visa, it will be That'll a real problem. No, there's a train right. soon, but 28 minutes. Yeah, soon, I know. The train will be soon, yeah, soon. I, I, I live next to Jerusalem, so I'm waiting for that. But, um, but I, I think that for me, I think for most of Israelis, we would like to see an American embassy in Jerusalem. It's our capital. It's our capital. Well, so it should be there. All embassies should be there. Now, 
of course, there's the question of timing. I agree with you that it can be a bargaining thing, and, but, but what, what it will cause, I would like to see an, a, an American embassy in Yerushalayim, an American embassy in Al-Quds, two embassies in the two capitals of the two states. And it, my, my guess is that the first embassy that we will have in Jerusalem, it will be a Palestinian embassy. After the Palestinians will establish their own embassy in Jerusalem, all countries will have their embassies in Jerusalem, which is the situation that should, should be. In, in, I, I work in, a, in an organization named the Geneva Initiative. We introduced a model for peace with details, solutions to all the problems. The Palestinians agreed in Geneva, but also in the formal negotiations, to recognize West Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and to have their embassy there once we solve the problem. But until then, it may be too dangerous and too risky to, to take a step that will only uh, encourage those who oppose peace, actually, uh, on the Arab side and the Palestinian side, instead of taking steps that will lead us uh, on that direction. I would add, as the uh, former American diplomat on the panel, uh, if there was a mistake in American policy, it was in 1948, when the United States didn't decide mm -hmm. to move the embassy to where Israel had declared its capital. Israel's expansion of the city limits in 67 and the extension of law administration <laughs> jurisdiction that took place then in 1980 actually made it virtually impossible for the United States to do so without also recognizing Israel's unilateral actions. Now this week, as I mentioned at the introduction, you know, UNESCO in this vile move has tried to disconnect Jerusalem from uh, the interests of the Jewish people. And that's, that needs to be rejected. But um, Israel itself, I think, cannot expect the United States in 2017 to both move the embassy and therefore to recognize the expanded municipal boundaries of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. That may be a bridge too far, even for this uh, administration. Uh, so this administration probably has no awareness of what happened in 1980, which, thank God, makes it a simpler issue. I'm wondering um, if the panelists can speak to what percentage or, um, of, of Israeli Jews understand what the occupation has meant to the Palestinian people, and what would be different if that changed and more Jewish Israelis understood the impact of the occupation? Thank you. Let me maybe give you a figure of a recent public opinion poll. Um, Two-thirds of the Israelis, 39 years old or younger, think that uh, Ariel, Kiryat Alba, other settlements, are part of the sovereign Israel. While the Israelis that are 60, old, 60 years old and, and older, two-thirds of them think that know the opposite like Efrat, like this, the place where you live, is not part of the state of Israel, according to Israel, not according to the international community. So the, the younger the Israelis are, they know less uh, the fact, they know less about the occupation, they know less that, that there is a line. If you go to a school, you see a map of Israel, you won't see the 67 lines, you won't see where the occupation starts. If you see, if you watch, uh, I don't know, the TV news, on whatever channel you choose, and you want to see the weather forecast for tomorrow, you will see the temperatures in Tel Aviv, in Be'er Sheva, and in Ariel, which is a settlement. So the change is in the state of minds of Israelis. Those people who think that Kirat Alba, who is next to Hebron, is part of Israel, they don't think so because they were there and they saw a, a flourishing Israeli city. It's because they were not there. They never visited that place. They don't go there. They don't go to the settlements, and for sure they don't go to the Palestinian cities or villages or well, refugee can't. camps. You can't. Um, so so the, the, the bottom line for your question is that the percentage of Israelis who know a little bit about what's going on there is, is extremely low. The media doesn't really cover it. We don't, we as Israelis, we don't care about it so much. We talk with ourselves. We talk about what's going on with the Israelis, not what's happening 20 minutes from our homes 
in, in the West Bank or in Gaza. We no, couldn't. I, I, oh. I, I just think it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, uh -huh. First of all, it's not entirely the case that uh, Israelis don't know. First of all, I agree with you completely. And most Israelis don't know, and not enough Israelis know, and there's no question that that's fundamentally right. But I mean, Haaretz, for example, Gidon Levi and Amir Ahas have made entire careers out of talking to Israelis about what's going on in the West Bank. Less than 4% of the Israelis read Haaretz. Yeah. Baruch Hashem. Less than 4%. Yeah, exactly. but, so if you're building on no, that. But I think a lot of people know. But if you're, totally training, more if you're awareness. totally training a puppy, it's much more Haaretz. awareness than Yeah, but 96% never heard about the occupation. I want to make one point about the line yeah. on the map, though. And you're right. If you look at the weather, the weatherman or the weather woman, you know, the, the map is, there's no green line. There's also no green line on the Palestinian map. I mean, one of the great ironies of the Middle East is that Israel and the Palestinian Authority show exactly the same map. We just say it's all ours, and they say it's all theirs. And I mean, they don't say it out loud. We out. say that on our, their side, it's incitement. On our side, it's fine. But, well, because we do have map. a country. Words, yeah, you're correct. That the map That's a minor is that point. Actually, but she asked about Israel. Metaphor. The map is a metaphor for how the two sides are actually not talking to each other. And I think, but I think, I, I, I think God is right that most Israelis do not know nearly enough about the occupation. There's an assumption in the question, which is if, that if only they knew more, we'd have options to make a change. And that may or may not be the case, right? It could be that we would know that it's very problematic and et cetera, et cetera, but still not see a lot of wiggle room in terms of what to do. But I think that in terms of the numbers, I think you're right. But I don't, I don't understand where the talk about occupation comes from. Didn't we have the Oslo Accords? Isn't there a Palestinian authority that's getting a tremendous amount of money and has their autonomy? So to talk about the occupation is if we never did Oslo and you still have Israel controlling every facet of the Palestinian Arabs' life is to completely ignore the last 25 years. You know, when I was on the Efrat Local Council and, and for 10 years, which is why I decided not to go into politics, but my Hebrew got a lot better because we were having a discussion, and it turns out that the words for compromise and to get undressed are very similar in Hebrew. So I was telling everybody and trying to say, like, let's get together, and what I was saying was, let's get naked. Okay? <laughs> which you can imagine how that went on. So, Sometimes I think things are like really, on, on a little thing, there's a whole other meaning. The whole point of Oslo, Israel was not established in order to establish a Palestinian state. Israel was established to have a safe homeland for the Jews. Yes, in 1967, we found ourselves in six days, suddenly in control of a lot of people who had been occupied by Jordan, by the way, for 19 years, and then nobody said boo when it came to, when it came to that, and nobody asked for human rights, and nobody said, where's the Palestinian state that in 1948 was supposed to be the two-state solution, and nobody says, and Sana doesn't address the point that had they only accepted the partition plan in 1947, we wouldn't be here tonight. So there's no sense of responsibility, and there's no sense of starting war and losing a war, there's no backseas. That's what happens. And in 1967, we didn't do what we did in 48, which is why we have so many people in Judea and Samaria. So to ask a question about the occupation is to say, like, we didn't do Oslo, and all these people haven't died, including my niece's baby who was hit in the head by a rock, and many other people have been to more funerals than I ever anticipated if I'd lived to be 120. All that happens because we gave them autonomy. Because we said, you don't want to be occupied here. Take care of your own business. And look what they did. They essentially established terror zones in the heart of Judea and Samaria. And if we give them a state, it'll be like Hamas too. And the reason that Abbas does not want Israel to leave Judea and Samaria is because he knows that he'll lose power to Hamas, just like happened in Gaza. He's very happy to have my son and other Israeli sons arresting his political rivals. And he can say, I don't know what's going on, because it keeps him in power. There is so much going on here that nobody wants to go through roadblocks, which, by the way, I have to go through every single day also. All right, nobody wants that. But we have to keep Israelis and Arabs and Muslims, Christians and Jews safe. And it's messy, and we make mistakes, and it's not easy. And when my son served in Hebron, and he came home, and he was really upset, and he said, last night, we had to go into an apartment. We were told that there, was like, there were weapons that were going to be used in a terror attack. And we had to go into an apartment and find them. He said, I'm looking through someone's underpants drawer, Ima. I felt like terrible. And we're looking somewhere, and the grandmother's screaming, and the kids are crying. He said, I felt sick. 
I didn't want to be there, but I also know that if I don't find those weapons and the next day a bus blows up in Jerusalem, it's my fault because I'm a soldier and I have to protect the people in this country. So is the situation a mess? Of course it is. But we need to lay the blame exactly where it belongs, which are the people who run the Palestinian Authority, who aid and abet terror, who, who give salaries to terrorists, who name squares after terrorists, and who foment and educate a society that jihad and death are the way to go. And until that changes, we have to protect ourselves, the, like I said, the Jews and Christians and, and Arabs among us, everybody in the country. But we cannot just like live in this la-di-da world that everything will be fine as long as we have a majority of Jews and leave everybody to their own business. That is absolute Okay, fantasy. I think we're going to take another question now. I think the Israeli-Palestinian conflict starts in the kindergarten. Uh, the kids are taught to hate the Jews, to kill the Jews, and completely brainwashed. How would you solve that problem? Well, we can't solve that problem. In other words, I don't disagree with the premise. Um, but look, I mean, we don't know exactly what happened in the meeting with Abbas and Trump today. Uh, but one of the things that ostensibly Trump was going to talk to Abbas about, which Eve just mentioned, uh, was, is the, the funding of terrorist families. You know, if, you, if you're a suicide bomber, you get funding for life. And the more people you kill, the more money you get, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's part of a larger societal issue. And it's not only, you're, you're right, that there's education from very early on, uh, but it's much more than that. It's the funding issue. It's when Abbas declares that there was really no temple because he's trying to undermine any Jewish ancestral claim to the land. I mean, this is a long stand. Arafat did the same thing. Uh, there's a whole attitude of, I think, in, uh, in, in Palestinian society, to be sure, of recognizing that there are probably, well, put it this way, there are, uh, uh, the Palestinians recognizing that the Jews have ancestral claims to the land. If the Palestinians have ancestral claims to the land, that's fine. The Jews do as well. Uh, and until both sides, I think, recognize that there are really two indigenous peoples of the land, both of them have lived for a very, very, very long time, as long as either side denies the ancestry and the ancestral link of that people to the land, we're going to have a problem. But there's no question that the incitement in terms of education, I believe at least, is much more problematic on the, uh, on the, on the Palestinian side. And the question really is, we can't do anything about it. I mean, there's really not a thing in the world that we can do about it. There may be something that the West can do about it by putting pressure on the Palestinians to change, but if you look through history, forcing other societies to change their internal notions of education has never worked particularly well. The Soviets can tell you that. L let me just add to it. Uh, I, I agree, first of all, that there is incitement in the Palestinian society against Israel. And I, I would like it to stop, for sure. And I think it's a responsibility also of their leaders, and they can do much more in order to prevent this in incitement. But we have to remember uh, one thing. We don't have peace. We are enemies. And in their eyes, they feel the occupation every single day and every single night. You know, Dan mentioned at the beginning a series of events that happened this week. There was one other development, maybe not important for us here in the room, but for others, it is quite important. Is we left Gaza, right? We left Gaza, no more soldiers in Gaza. Yesterday, Israel decided agree to extend the area where the Gaza fishermen can, can fish to nine miles. Instead of eight miles, we gave them one other mile where they can go with their boats to fish. So what do you think? They will say us, thank you very much. You, you think that the family of Palestinians that feel at night the Israeli soldiers come to their homes in the middle of the night, wake up, the, the grandfather, the grandmother, and the little babies go from one home to another. And there are 2.5 million Palestinians in the West Bank. Not only the terrorists live there. And they wake them up, and they take pictures of them, and they write down who does exactly what. And then those Palestinians read in the newspaper, in an Israeli newspaper, not in Alex, by the way, on Friday. They just read that. that I read the Israeli that the Israeli soldiers did it and they brought the information about every single old person and baby in this village and they didn't do anything about it. They just threw it to the garbage, all this information. So when the soldier asked the commander, so why did we do it? So he said, because they have to understand who controls 
the area here. They have to understand who is the boss, right? Now they feel humiliated. And if, if you think that they will love us, they will educate their kids to love us against the background of this reality, I think you are wrong. So the, yeah, I so the Mufti of that's Jerusalem. Enough. That's enough. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I respectfully, there are two sides to this coin. And I can ask you the same question. How do we stop Israelis uh, and how do we educate Israelis to stop hating Arabs? On, <laughs> only in last Purim there was a, an article on the TV uh, that showed uh, a mother dressing her uh, son in a soldier uniform. And she told him, what do you want to be when you grow older? He said, I want to be a soldier. I want to kill Arabs. So. You, you can find examples on both ways. You can, but I think that maybe that's true. Very, and there's examples of, of racism and idiocy in every single society exactly. across the globe. You have it in Boston. You have it in Newton. I mean, that, that's true, but you can't compare. There is no systematic governmental exactly. incitement of hatred of Arabs in Israel. Right. There's just Quite not. That's just not. That just doesn't exist. When, when Bibi Netanyahu, in his last election, texted the entire uh, voters, go to vote, because the Arabs are uh, headed to, right. to the pool station. No, what, that was disgusting. What does that, that was disgusting. What does that mean? There, were, there, there, were those of us, there were those of us who thought it was disgusting and okay, racist exactly. and vile, so it's, but it's, not, but not it's one disgusting. No, that it's not. not. No, it's not. No. It's not in the curriculum of schools all across the country. You open up Israeli textbooks, it's not filled with vile stuff about no, Arabs. It's it's only, it only teaches the Jewish people that they came to an empty land and the promised land, a land with no people. It doesn't say that. Doesn't you just have to look at Israeli yeah. textbooks. I, 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 My kids went to with, school with those textbooks. It's just not what the textbooks I, say. I went to Jewish high school. I know okay. exactly why they They do not talk about an empty exactly. land. There is no symmetry. But there is a problem in both societies. Agreed, and the but problem the is, is because there is a no no, I agree, right? I agree there's that no there's no symmetry. symmetry. I agree, I agree there's, there's no symmetry, symmetry exactly. in the education, in the textbooks, and there's no symmetry in the situation on the ground. So but, if we, if the, it's not true that there's nothing that we can do about the Palestinian incitement, there's one thing that for sure we can do. We can put an end to the occupation. Okay, but I just want to say that that's a problem at Gadi. I want to actually, this is an ridiculous. important point. This is here is, I mean, I didn't think we we're going to get to this tonight, but I want to back up something that Eve said. Um, you know, the strange things happen in Newton, Massachusetts, but, you know, we like each other. But, um, look, I, to say that we can end the occupation and that is going to end incitement. No, no, the, the end of conflict would put an end to the incitement. Okay, the end of the conflict will put yeah. the end of incitement. You know, and there will be no end of conflict for this history, I don't think that history bears that out. And it here doesn't. I think we have to be, as Eve said before, very eloquently and much more eloquently than I can say, I think that we have to recognize that this conflict's almost 100 years old. In other words, the armed conflict, it depends where you want to start it, but for sure by 1929 in Hebron, we're talking about a war, and we're now in 2017, so we're getting very close to a century. And I think while it's true that both sides have an unlimited number of gripes against the other, and both sides have people who have done and say terrible things, and Israelis live in, in dread, and Palestinians live in humiliation and dread, and, 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 and. Let's just remember what we're talking about. Nobody incited the violence that led to the wiping out of Hebron over the course of a weekend, and the, the extermination of a community, basically, that had existed for hundreds the of Jewish years. Jewish community. Jewish community. Nobody, nobody led to that. In 1936, when the British sent the Peel Commission, and they said, you know what, the Jews and the Arabs can't live together. So let's divide the country. The Jews were very unhappy, but they said yes. And the Arabs were very unhappy and started the riots of 1936, 1937. In 1947, when the, when the General Assembly was getting ready to vote, the Jews were getting much less land than they thought the Balfour Declaration had promised them. And Chaim Weitzman, who was much more pithy than he was adept at politics, said, if what they give us is the size of a tablecloth or more, we take it. And the Jews voted yes in 47, and the, Palestine, and the Arabs said no in 47. That's why there was a Nakba. If they had said yes, there would be no Nakba. But there's a Nakba because they said no in 29. They started violence in 29. They said no in 36. They said no in 47. Right. When Israel captured all those lands in 67, they went back to Khartoum in the Sudan and came back. No peace, no recognition, no negotiations. Why did Oslo die? because somebody turned off the oxygen? No, Oslo died because as soon as it was signed, Palestinian terror went through the ceiling. 
And there's actually indication from Dalia Rabin and others that Yitzchak Rabin himself was talking among his confidants about pulling the plug on Oslo, or at least pulling the throttle back before he was, before he was assassinated. All right, we're going to try to get more. Last one sentence. This is just not to suggest that all of the blame lies on any side. It doesn't. This is very complicated. But to have this conversation without pointing to history and which side has more or less tried time and again to make this work and which side has denied the other right is simply not a conversation. This is what John Simon of blessed memory dreamed of an evening like this at the Jewish Community Center and with our partners at CGP. I am so proud of our audience and our panelists for creating this experience tonight at this JCC. And, and again, that's why it's important to me to recommend the work of other writers, particularly writers of color who are writing about this, because um, my experience is limited. And I'm not going to try to tell anyone how other, I'm trying not to tell people how other people's subjective experience of this on the wrong side of the equation is. What I think, the reason that I wrote the book was because there is a tendency for race and the race beat to be a thing that non-white people write about. Like, that's like, if it's a, or, like, that's the place that non-white people have the beat. 